Okay, so what you're about to see is um, a year on a dairy farm, uh, an illustrated talk that I give to different groups around the area. Uh, I did upload five parts of this last year and this year I've decided to put all the bits together if you like so that you can just sit down and if you want to that is you could sit down and hear me talk about our farm and what it's like to be a farmer um, I recorded this talk in front of a group uh, of about 40 people I think at the time uh, and it was before my father died so some of it is a little bit out of date I'm talking about him in the present terms unfortunately he's no longer with us uh, but it, it is uh, hopefully interesting to some of you who like um, to know a bit more about our farm uh, and also it's um, actually pictures from my book A Year on a Dairy Farm which you can still buy from my website um, which you call knock.co.uk um, so anyway sit back and enjoy uh, a lengthy discussion about my farm or our farm cheers It's nice to be here, and I can say you're all better looking than Chipping Sobby WI. <laughs> <laughs> Some of you, not all of you. Um, well, because you're so good looking, I'm going to take your photograph. Right, can you all say cheese? There we go. Oh, sorry, sir, I'll try to eat you out later. Um, well, I, I, the reason I, I took the picture with this camera is to just show you the camera that I took all the photographs uh, with that you're going to see tonight. Um, you might know a little bit about me. I, I'm a dairy farmer from Titherington in South Gloucestershire, so I'm not very far from here. Um, and really, I can drive quite quick when I'm late um, to get here. Um, I, uh, what I did in 2009, I decided to do a project just to photograph our farm for a year. Um, now, I'm not into photography really. Um, the one thing I, I knew though that was I needed a small compact camera to keep in my top pocket. It was no good being buying one of these big professional SLR cameras that you carry around because realistically, you know, in my working day, I haven't, you know, got, I can't just get out and pose. So I needed something I could put in my top pocket. So I actually went to Tesco's and bought this camera for 90 quid. Um, they don't make it anymore, it's just a little Sony camera. So it's a lovely little camera actually to put in your pocket. Um, and then I proceeded to snap away for a year and you're going to see some of the pictures tonight and then you, I'm going to sort of tell you the things that it led to after I had a book published from the photographs. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about our farm though. Uh, we are the cliche small family farm. I work with my brother Tom and my dad Bill. My dad's 81 and at half past six this morning he was up helping on the farm. He hasn't retired because farmers don't really retire do they? Um, we only milk 70 cows which is very small in this day and age. We also do um, quite a bit of conservation work. We're in a thing called uh, higher level stewardship, which is uh, an environmental scheme, um, an entry level stewardship, and we do a few projects um, on the farm under that scheme, which I really enjoy. Uh, so I'm going to start the, uh, with the year. Can we have some lights out? I don't know how these lights work. Are these, I'm in control. Okay, just have a go. All right, see what happens then. Really? Tell me when the. That's it. We just uh, we don't want them all out, do we? Is that all right? Okay, brilliant. Okay, so we'll start the year. Well, we'll start a year with the picture I didn't take, um, and you can see why. This this is the earliest picture we've got from our on our farm. Um, our family have been at Newhouse Farm since 1822, so we're just about getting the hang of it now, really. Um, but this picture was taken in 1887, and you can see it's a lovely, brilliant family portrait there. It's very Victorian, isn't it? If you, if you look there, the guy stood up very proud there is my great-great-grandfather, William Cornock, with his watch chain, and his wife is sat on the chair there, um, and this is his brother and sister over here, but also, interestingly enough, in, in the picture is his housekeeper there, and his maid. My wife's now got a microwave and a dishwasher. Um, <laughs> she, she'd rather have a maid and a housekeeper, but that didn't happen. Uh, I actually, I, my parents live in the farmhouse. I live off the farm, but um, I travel there only up the road from it, really. Um, and then we go, there, there's what we look like now. So it's a bit more casual, isn't it? Same, that's in the same, outside the front of the house, the same group of us, uh, over 130 years later. And there's my mum and dad in the middle and my brother there, my wife there, looking very tired because that was just after she gave birth to my second son, Harry, and my little boy, Jack, there. 
But that's my nephew there doing the karate chop in front. And you can see how things have changed from the Victorian era. It's all very casual now, isn't it? You know, it's a lot more relaxed. Society's changed a lot. Anyway, coming on to the start of the year, we've got January here. And um, you can see a, a very frosty morning, a very cold day. Um, I was very lucky when I decided to do this project. We had a year where we had some snow because realistically, we don't often get a lot of snow, you know, really harsh winters. And um, from a photography point of view, if you don't have snow on a farm between about November and about April, all you just see is brown, brown. Because everything's mud or poo, really. Um, but on this picture here, that's a view of the farm taken from Tillerington Hill. I had to go up on the hill to get that. And when I was up there, this actual tree was in the, in the front of the front of my view. So I actually stood on my car roof to get that picture. Um, but my car roof's now got a dent in it. Where, <laughs> where it doesn't take the weight of, <laughs> weight of me. Um, but this is looking across to Bath direction over there. Bristol's to the right and Chipping Sobbing Yate, I'm guessing, is about over here somewhere. And there's the farmhouse there. You can see on the right there. And to the left, the buildings. And then our farm goes off to the left. Um, so we're coming into winter there, like I said, my dad there bringing the coffee out in the morning. Uh, always likes his flat cap. I don't know actually how much extra protection in the winter it gives him on top of a balaclava there. Um, but he's bringing us the coffee at eight o'clock in the morning. He's also got odd gloves on, but we'll forgive him that, won't we? Um, so he's, he's like bringing the coffee out. And there's my poor brother there in the, in the yard. You can see how bleak it is really, can't you, from that picture. Uh, what's interesting is um, when I had the book published, I had a number of re reviews done with different magazines and stuff. Um, and one of them was a magazine called Amateur Photographer. Uh, and the chap came out to interview me and he said, oh, you know, that's a really good picture. He said, you've got this, you know, the snow streaks on there, you know, with the time of delay and everything like that. And I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, because really what happened is my brother didn't actually like having his picture taken and I was hiding behind a wall when I took this photo. So, so what I did, I actually jumped out and pressed the shutter as I was jumping. And that's why you got the snow streak. There, there isn't actually any skill on my part. It's just very lucky with that picture. So that's why it, it gives it the effect of a bleak midwinter, if you like. Um, anyway, you can see how cold it can get from that picture. That's minus 12 and that was taken at 9 o'clock in the morning. Uh, now, kind of a temperature like that, if you're inside your house looking out for your double glazing, you just turn the heating up a bit, don't you? And that's all right, isn't it? But from a farming point of view, it's a bit of a problem. And for definitely for livestock farming, it is because it causes problems like this, water troughs, freezing. Um, and bearing in mind, we've got, well, we've got 70 milking cows, but at the moment, we've probably got about 150 head of cattle on the farm. They've all got a drink every day. They need a lot of water. When the troughs freeze, it's a real issue. And we spend a lot of time either going around with kettles trying to get the water troughs going, because you can see at the back there's a little inlet there that usually freezes on that there. Or um, I was carting water in containers from a tap that was inside. It's a lot of work, you know. <laughs> on the plus side, you do get some lovely views. And there's a, a nice picture of an oak tree there in, in one of our hay meadows. Now, we're going to see that picture again in the middle of summer and the contrast is remarkable so we just visualize that tree for a moment we'll have another look at it again in in june but coming through here i always try and take a you know a few clever pictures and this is where i thought i'd be clever right um so i thought oh, maybe i could get a nice sunrise over the the buildings not very attractive buildings admittedly but um so i walked out across this field take the pictures but you can see in the picture you can see the extra set of footprints there can't you mm -hmm. uh, well this is where I confess this is where I prove I'm an amateur because the reason there's an extra set of footprints is when I got over to the other side of that field I realized I'd forgotten my camera <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so I actually had to go back and get it and then come back so that's why it looks quite busy uh, but you can also see <laughs> you can also see in the picture Another set of footprints here, and you can go off just to the left there of a rabbit. And, and that's the one thing that's interesting from my point of view when it snows, is you suddenly realise how alive the countryside is, even in the middle of winter. Because if you look out on a field now, it looks very dead, doesn't it? And there's not much going on. <coughs> but when you get snow, you can suddenly see the footprints of all the different animals. And certain fields are almost like little mini motorways, because the animals all seem to use the same track. And you can see where a deer or a fox or a badger or something has gone across, which you wouldn't see without the snow. So it's quite interesting. Not only can you see my footprints getting my camera, but you can see all the other animals on the farm. Um, anyway, 
We're into our cattle shed now. Um, and I know there's some farmers here, so uh, I don't need to tell them their business, but not everyone knows about farming. So I'm going to start on a kind of assume that you know nothing and we'll work our way up from there, okay? So on a, on a dairy farm like ours, what happens is about November time, the cattle come inside. And that's really because A, the ground gets churned up too much, but B, the, the grass stops growing. So you've got two issues there. You get, you've got too much mud and not enough food. So we bring them inside and they're inside then from um, November till about the beginning of April when the grass starts growing again. Um, it creates a lot of extra work. Uh, we have to feed them, but we also have to clean them out twice a day and bed them down. And you can see here the straw there where they're lying there and these passageways we clean out twice a day. And we feed them a mixture of grass silage and maize silage and a bit of rape meal. So we're trying to give them a bit of a balanced diet to make up for the fact they're not getting fresh grass. Um, they do love the, the, um, the maize silage actually. They almost like when you put the rape meal in with it, it's almost like muesli and they really like that. Um, but we, we feed them. And of course, the problem with feeding them is you get a lot of cow muck then, don't you? Um, and here's my dear old dad there grafting away while my brother sits on the tractor driving up and down. Um, there's, a, there's a theme you're going to see through tonight is that my dad seems to do a lot of work in the pictures, whereas either my, dad, my brother's on a tractor or I'm taking a photograph. Uh, <laughs> anyway, we, we clean them out twice a day and then, of course, we, we take the muck out on the land. Um, in fact, it's perfect recycling because the cows eat the grass, it comes out as muck, we put it back on the grass, makes the grass grow. Um, now, you can see in this picture here that I'm out with the muck spreader, but the, um, this was actually the day that was my day to take the muck out. So I took the muck out, but I also thought I need to get a picture for, um, you know, to, to show what I'm doing. So this is where I have to ask if anyone work at health and safety in this room. Because <laughs> if they do, you better put your fingers in your ears, okay? <laughs> Because what I actually did when I took this picture, and this is really, really bad, okay, I went in the field and I put the tractor in a gear, low gear. Can you see where it's going? And then, and then what I did, I actually jumped out of the tractor and let the tractor drive itself up the, up the field. With, so there's no one actually in the cab, which is why there's no picture of a tractor in the photograph. Um, I've often thought, actually, if, if there was any ramblers or anyone walking by and they looked over the hedge and just saw this tractor going up, <laughs> up the field with no one in it, what they would have thought. Um, so then I, then I ran round, jumped back in and, this, you know, drove off. And the interesting thing is, and you see here, I've got a range of cards I've done for my photographs and there's one of the muck spreader, OK? And it's quite a good selling card, actually, surprisingly. One bloke bought that card for his wife for wedding anniversary. <laughs> and, he actually gave it, and the reason he gave it to me, he said, I've, I'm always in the shit with you. <laughs> <laughs> so happy, happy anniversary, darling. <laughs> but, but actually, he did, he did actually buy her a nice card as well. Which I, I thought it was quite a nice little thing, that, really. Um, so, you know, where there's muck, there's brass or whatever. Um, Anyway, we're coming through into February time now. Well, this is probably about February time. And there we are. We haven't got that tractor anymore, but uh, that's an old, old Massey, but we've changed it now. But um, I do the hedge trimming on our farm, and this is all, I do it in conjunction with our conservation work. Um, because it, you might be surprised to know there is actually a season for hedge trimming, and it's from the end of August till the end of February. That's the time you're supposed to do it. Because other, otherwise, nesting birds would get destroyed or. or upset if you like so you have to do it in that time but there's also a better time to do it in that season and that the better time to do it is january and february really if you can get on the land uh, the reason i say that is that because if you go out hedge trimming in september all the berries on that hedge that are there for the birds to eat are just going to be obliterated so all your rose hips and blackberries or anything are going to be gone so i tend to do my hedge trimming in january and february to allow the birds to have those the fruit off the tree off the branches. The other thing I also do is um, I trim half the farm one year and half the farm the other year so that any one time there's two years growth on a part of the farm and that's just to give the the birds more cover for the winter you know because if you trim these hedges right down there's nothing for them to shelter in or anything. Um, the other thing as well which is, which is something that you can have a look yourself um, is Next time you're out for a walk, have a look in the landscape and just see how many old trees and how many young trees there are in the fields. Because since this machine has been invented, it's very easy to sit on your tractor with the arm out and just go along like that and not leave any young trees behind. 
And I see it now on quite a lot of farms. So there's a lot of these old trees, like this one behind, an old ash tree, but not many saplings left. And I think it's very important that farmers should leave at least a couple of trees a year on their farm to grow up, because otherwise we're going to have a situation in, say, 50 years' time where all these old trees have started to die, and we're going to have a lot more of an open landscape with no trees in them. And the tree's free if you trim around it in a hedge. You haven't got to pay to plant it. So I try and do that every year, um, leave, leave one or two saplings. Um, anyway, we're coming through into springtime now. It's a bit of tabioca pudding now. I think you remember that from school days. Uh, there's a bit of a close-up there. Um, we, on our farm, we've got five ponds, which we originally used for drinking for the cattle before uh, water troughs were invented. And under the high-level stewardship, I received funding to restore these. And when I say restore them, it's to clean them out. Uh, make them bigger or to t cut away the scrub around them to let light into them and I've cleaned all five out now and it's quite satisfying doing a job like that I do enjoy it uh, especially when you see the benefits in a few years down the line and things like the frog spawn have come back into them um, I saw a heron the other day sat looking into the pond which is good because the thing is I haven't put any fish in that pond myself so whatever that heron's there waiting for has come by nature you know which is nice because it all balances out in the end um, it's quite satisfying getting the frog spawn. I bring a jam jar home to my kids and they go, oh, dad, I'd rather watch CBBC or something. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I do enjoy that. My nephew said, oh, I don't like that picture. It's all eyes. <laughs> it is a bit, isn't it? It's like something from a horror film. <laughs> but a uh, frog spawn in the spring is great. And it also, the one thing I've noticed is that the frogs always seem to lay their frog spawn in the same spot. And you can, in one pond, I can always go there every about March time and find frog spawn. So we're coming on into spring now. Lovely bunch of daffodils there. Um, just see if you're awake. Um, so we've got the cowslips coming out. Uh, and these are actually not on our farm. These are actually on a bit of a common that I manage. Um, and you might think, well, what do you do? What do you mean manage a common? Because most people see a common, just see it as an open piece of land. And maybe you ought to plant some trees on it. Well, the thing is that my actual job under the scheme high level stewardship is to actually stop trees and things growing over it and stop scrub invasion uh, because some of these commons are actually quite important because they're un unimproved grassland they haven't been sprayed or anything they've got a lot of biodiversity there but also they're good habitats for um, places for things like barn owls to hunt over because ba barn owls need long grass um, and you know most farms don't have long grass all year round whereas the common probably will so I'm actually paid to, to not, you know, to stop the scrub invasion on it. And also, because they're not ploughed up and sprayed and everything, you do get things like the cow slips on them. <coughs> the biggest problem I've got to contend with is that quite often people park their cars and pinch a few every year because they see it as a free garden centre. Because if you get a white bell, what's a cow slip? It's about five quid or something, isn't it? So they park up and nick them from the common. And I, just as I'm getting a big kind of area of covering, someone comes along and thinks I'll have those. Um, Anyway, here we are, back to my dad grafting. I told you, I've got to keep him working, keep him fit. It's the way to keep young though, isn't it? Keep working. It's no good sat and watching Deal or No Deal all day, is it? Um, anyway, in, here we are with a picture of my nephew. He's got the flat cap habit now, look. Contagious, really. Um, you'll be wearing them by the time you leave tonight. I should have a stall selling them, really. <laughs> Now this is one of two orchards we've got on the farm and you can see here my dad is just fencing an apple tree here, a young apple tree. Um, and you might think, well why is he putting such a big amount of fencing around it? Well, if you've got something like sheep or something like that, you don't really need to do fencing like that. But because we've got cattle, they've got a very long reach. Not only have they got a long neck, but they've also got a very long tongue. And the one thing that cattle like, and they've some experience, is they like eating the fruit off trees. So as soon as you get any fruit within reach of a, tr of a pear tree, an apple tree, they'll try and take it. But, not, but on a young tree, when they take the, the fruit, they'll rip, rip it down, rip the branches with it. So you need to fence these trees probably for about 10 years. And you can see one in the background there that has been fenced. And it's just getting to a reasonable height now, so that probably without the reach of a, tr of a cow. So that's okay. Um, so we've got one orchard here that is an old orchard. And you see some older trees here. 
On the other farm, I've got now got a new orchard, and it'll go, go forward here. Um, and in 2010, I replanted this orchard. It was, it was an old orchard, and you can see behind it one of the last of the remaining trees in it. And they were called standard fruit trees. They're they the big old trees that you don't see anymore. Because a modern fruit farm now wants dwarf trees that they can harvest really easily. They don't want these big old standards. So a lot of these old orchards that you might remember as children around this area have all sort of died out. You know, every time there's a gale, another, one seems, another fruit tree seems to blow over. Mm -hmm. But I actually got 100% funding from the taxpayer, thanks very much ladies and gents, um, to replant one of these orchards uh, because of the fact that people are realising they're good for biodiversity but also it's a characteristic of, the, of these counties so it's important that we have some of these old orchards. So what I did in, in November 2010, unfortunately the coldest November day for 100 years, um, I invited 27 families to come and plant these trees with me and I gave each family a tree Points West actually came out and filmed it. Um, I gave each family a tree. I asked them to plant a time capsule underneath their tree. In fact, we go back. You can see the time capsules there. Some Wally decided to plant one that big. Honestly, if you ever plant a time capsule under a tree, make it really small. <laughs> because you've got to dig a really big hole for that box. Um, so, they, so they each got a tree and they had to plant it. The only provision was they provide their own cap time capsule with whatever they wanted to put in it. Um, and you see all the families with the kids here running around. Some people actually don't know which way a tree goes up. Um, it's amazing how many instructions you've got to provide when you want to plant a tree. Um, that's my friend, Laddie Chaps. I'm sure he wouldn't appreciate me showing you that. <laughs> but um, it was a really nice project to do. What I did when I planted the trees, I photographed every family with their tree. Okay. So it's a record because the kids were, every family had young children. So the idea being that as the trees grow, the kids grow as well. Um, and you can see now in the field what it's like now. In fact, if you walked around, some of you came around and, and saw this. Um, there's the original old fruit trees. There are only a couple left. That's a peri pear. Um, and these are the new ones that I've planted. Ne around each of these trees is a fencing to stop the cattle getting to them but also on each one there's a little copper plaque that says the name of the um, variety of, of the fruit there but also the name of the family that planted them so that they can all come back and see their tree um, it's no good just trying to remember is it you'll easily forget and then we go oh I think it's that one or oh, is it that one um, the interesting thing was that the varieties are all old traditional ones there are a few I've got a Cox's orange pip in there and a Bramley because that's obviously easy to have those but I've got some other ones like Beauty of Bath um, I've got one called Seven Back, I've got one, one called Hen's Turds, which is a cider fruit, which I've no idea what cider tastes like, but I think the clue might be in the name. Uh, but it is one of the best projects I've done, not just because it's free, because the taxpayer paid for it, but because it brings life to the farm in the form of the trees, but also getting children involved and doing something interesting, you know, because a lot of the time on the farm, milking cows and just being in the field is quite boring really it's the same every day I've done it for 30 odd years doing stuff like this makes me really excited so that's why I do it really um, anyway so springtime we're back on the we're, I'm glad you get into summer we're doing long time spring coming in um, if you think of a field a bit like your lawn we've got to uh, get rid of the bumps on it like you might roll your lawn so we roll our field so there's a concrete yeah. roller there then like you might want to get rid of the moss in your lawn you, you rake it out. So we're raking the, raking the grass here. We're raking out the dead, gra dead grass and the moss and spreading the muck out a bit with the chain harrows. And then finally, what you don't do on your lawn is you don't want it to grow really fast. But I want it to grow quite fast for the cows. So we put fertilizer on. And then come one glorious day at the beginning of April, we open the gate and the cows go out. Oh. And I can breathe a sigh of relief because I've had five months of feeding and cleaning and God knows what, and it's a real relief for that. They can't wait to go out. I can't wait for them to go out. Uh, we'll see a video at the end of what it's like, and it's brilliant. Um, so they go out then, and, and then the farm is really coming to life. So we've got some bluebells here in the wood. Very lucky we've got a small piece of uh, woodland on the farm. Uh, I was up there with a guy from Radio Bristol doing some stuff, actually. He got quite romantic. I thought he was going to propose to me at one point. Um, it's amazing the effect a bluebell wood will have on people, actually. But it is a fantastic time of year to walk, walk through and see. Um, and then we're into, we're into April now, and, or sort of April, May time, probably April. Um, and we're ploughing the fields here, ready to... The only crop we really grow is maize, which we grow to feed our cattle. Now, 
This is quite an interesting picture if you want to focus on this a second. And uh, if you're interested in your tractors, there's a, there's a FIFO reversible um, plow there with a 150 horsepower New Holland tractor on there. So we have a woo for that. <laughs> there you go. There you go. I knew, I knew you'd all be impressed with that. Um, but, but really, that's if you want to interest in tractors, machinery, some people are, that's what you can look at. But the other side of the coin of this is that I've captured with this picture a moment in time. Because it's very easy to look at something and think it'll always be there and then, and then it's not. And I say that because my dad's still on the farm now, but when he was a boy we had two shire horses on the farm. And a bloke in the village used to come down to the farm and walk behind these two shire horses to play the fields. And in my dad's lifetime, it's gone. And all of you, some of you here must have grown up seeing shire horses around in the countryside on farms. The, the two shire horses left our farm in 1952. And in 1952, my dad took down the harnesses and put them on the wall in the barn. And they're still there now. But I've never seen those shire horses. I've, we haven't even got a photograph of them which is a great shame, so I would have loved to have seen what they were like. And now, you see, I see a shire horse in some sort of display on a county show or something. I've never seen one on a farm actually working, and I probably won't. But when those shire horses went, no one was thinking like that. No one was thinking it's a real moment of history gone. Because if you think about it, we ploughed fields in this country for thousands of years with either horses or oxen, and everyone did it, and it was just always there. And in the blink of an eye, it's gone. And now we're on to tractors. Um, but the other thing is, in, the, in 50 years time, people might be looking at this picture of a tractor here and laughing at it, because why isn't it solar powered? You know, it's fossil fuel, that might be so archaic as, as the um, Shah horses. So there you go, there's the moment in time in that picture. Anyway, we're planting the maize there, that's maize seed, it's, it's coated in some sort of bird repellent and different things, because uh, the crows do like to eat it. Uh, and we're drilling away with the maize there to get it to uh, grow, hopefully for harvesting in October. Anyway, also the rest of the farm is coming alive. This is a nice picture of a tree here. And do you remember I said to you about the reach of a cow? Yeah. Well, Someone did say to me, how do you trim your, your trees so neatly? <laughs> well, that, trim, that tree is beautifully trimmed by our cows. And if you look, you can just see on the lower branches, you can see the ones that are a bit just in reach of a cow's tongue. Um, but what's nice about that tree is I knew it when it was a conker. Because I planted it. So um, that's quite nice being on a family farm. You do see things through like that, you know. Uh, but if you wonder why the cows are all going in that direction, they're just on their way in for milking. So uh, here we are in, in uh, the lower fields, and these are the fields that are less intensively managed, and we, and we put our heifers down here. There's, I think there might be an Abinangus uh, there as well. So they graze the lower fields, and then the more intensive fields near the farm get used for uh, our... Well, I said that we only do one crop, but we really do two crops, because we do a crop of grass. Uh, and this is May time, we're silage making. Um, now, I, I speak to quite a few different groups, and I speak to some groups in Bristol and stuff, and I, I go on about tractors driving down the roads, and I forget that in the middle of Bristol you're not going to get a tractor driving down the road, are you? <laughs> but if you live in this area, you're quite used to seeing a tractor whizzing around it, aren't you? And, and you know what it's like in May time? They're all going hell for leather, aren't they? You, you come down the corner and there's a blooming trailer behind the tractor, and you're like, whoa! Um, and there's a reason for that, uh, because it's a very intense time of year, May, because what we've got to do is we've got to get our winter feed for our dairy herd. But not only we've got to get it, but we've got to get it right. Because we've got to get the right quality and the right quantity, and the two aren't necessarily the same thing. Because if you harvest it late, you get a lot of bulk, a lot of quality, quantity, but you won't get the quality because you won't have enough sugar or too much, not enough sugar in the grass. So what you want to do is get not too much grass with the right quality. So that's quite a difficult balance. Um, so, but also you've got to rely on the weather. We've got to cut this and let it wilt for 24 hours, so without any rain on it, ideally. So what you do, the two things to get it right, is you look at the weather forecast, make sure you're going to get a day of good weather, and then secondly, you look out the window and see what your neighbour's doing. 
Because if he's got his mower on, you think, I better go mowing. <laughs> he must know something I don't know. <laughs> so that's, that's the two tips. Look at the weather forecast, see what your neighbour's doing. Um, and what we do, we get contractors in for this because we couldn't afford this machinery. I'm not exactly sure of the value of this kit, but I think at least 150,000 for the forager and the tractors are 50 grand each easily. Um, so you're talking 250 grand in that picture there, really. Um, so they come in, we mow it one day, they, they harvest it the next, and basically what they do is they pull it through that machine and as it goes through the machine, it chops it up into small bits. Then they bring it into the silage clamp. There we go. There's another bit of kit that's not ours because we couldn't afford that either. It's not really worth us owning it for one day, is it really? One day's use a year. So we bring it into the pit and what we're doing is we're just basically pickling it. Like you might do pickled onions or pickled eggs or something. We're pickling the grass and, and the, how we do that is as they push it in, they squash it down to get all the air out of it. And then when we finish squashing it down, we seal it with plastic. And the sealing with plastic, as long as it's airtight, it will, it will gradually sort of ferment and pickle, but it won't go rotten. And that's our grass winter feed. So it's not a complicated process. It's just the fact of getting it right for the, um, to get the quality. Right. Do you remember the snowy picture? Here we go. There it is in the summer. It's a bit different, isn't it? Isn't it brilliant how England, I think England is an amazing country because how it comes alive from looking out the window now and you think, God almighty, summer's never going to come. And then you forget and you see that and you think, God, it's wonderful, isn't it? Um, anyway, this is uh, one of three fields we've got in our higher level stewardship as semi-improved grassland, okay? Now, semi-improved grassland is what the whole of England would have been covered with before the war. It's... Uh, looks pretty like that that's a lot of buttercups there are other plants in there but it's not very productive and um, up until the war we had a lot of land like that and then after the well during the war and after the war there was a big push to produce more food I mean you imagine it's all very well looking at nice flowers but you can't eat them can you um, so when there was all the campaign you know when people were having rationing and there was a dig for victory campaign and stuff there was a big push to improve agriculture in the UK uh, and about 92% of semi-improved grassland has, was got rid of. Um, it was ploughed up, sprayed off, um, and put into improve, improved things like Italian ryegrass and stuff. So there's pockets of this left, okay, which are actually very good for biodiversity. And now people have got to the stage where we all have got full stomachs and there's loads of food in Tesco's. We want to keep the bits like this now because we, we, can, we can afford to keep these bits. Uh, and I actually received some funding to look after it. And you might sort of think that's funny. How, again, how do you look after it? Well, what I, what I don't do now is I don't put any fertiliser on it, not even manure. And the reason for that is by reducing the amount of fertility, you improve the chance for the flowers to, to grow. Because wildflowers don't like fertile land. They like poor soil. Because otherwise the grass outcompetes them. The other thing as well is I have to make a hay crop at least every two to three years. And the reason for making a hay crop is that wildflowers set, um, set seed in about June time. If I make silage in May, I've cut them all off before they've set seed. So by making hay in, say, end of June, July, those seeds can be spread around by my hay making and, and spread the wildflowers around the field. The other thing I do get, oh, I should tell you before I move on, I should tell you, I showed this picture to a farmer and the first thing he said to me, he went, cool, I want spray in, didn't there? <laughs> <laughs> but that was kind of old school because we've come away from that a bit in farming now. You, some people want to spray everything, but there is a, you know, people do care about the land, not just for um, spraying. Um, but the other thing I, I, I have done on it, okay, is I actually put some more wildflower seeds into it. And um, I received some funding for what, for, to get some wildflower seeds. I was putting 29 different types of wildflowers back into this field, okay? So I received some funding, and, and when I set up the stewardship scheme in 2010, I was allocated 2,000 pounds for wildflower seeds, okay? But I did then did the orchard, and then I went back to do the wildflower seed planting, and they went, oh, sorry, budget cuts, it's all gone. Well, the thing is, I know all these governments companies and groups and everything they also got no money but they've always got a biscuit tin around the back with a few quid in it haven't they and i said to the bloke at natural England, i'm sure you got something a bit and he goes mm, okay he found me 450 quid okay and then i topped it up with another 150 quid to 600 pounds okay for wildflower seeds but the question is how much does wildflower seeds cost how much do you think a ton of wildflower seeds 
Some of you, if, you, if you've heard me speak before, don't guess, but I'll give you, give you a clue, okay? I'm not an arable farmer, so I'm going to get this figure not exactly right, but say a tonne of, of milling wheat is about 140 quid. Do you reckon? I don't know. Less than that. Less than, that, less than 140 pounds a tonne for milling wheat, okay? How much do you think a tonne of wild flower seeds costs? So you shout 500? 1,000 pounds? A few thousand? Any advance on a few thousand? 10,000. Oh, that's the highest bid I've ever had on a good <laughs> But, well, I'll tell you, a ton of wildflower seeds is, drum roll, £136,000. So, my 600 quid for wildflower seeds got me a Tesco carrier bag. <laughs> you didn't, I didn't get much, but I got, in fact, I got four and a half kilos. And, and it seems a funny, if you work it out, the tonnage price, it seems odd, but um, it's because I ordered different mixes, so some of them are slightly more or less than, than others, but it's a lot of money, four and a half, 600 quid got me four and a half kilos. Um, and that picture there of the wild flower seeds was taken in my hand. Now the reason it's so expensive is if you think about how small wild flower seeds are, like that cowslip you saw in the picture earlier, you need a lot of wild flowers to get a ton of seed. And believe it or not, there are actually farms in the east of the country that just grow wildflowers. They grow fields of, of um, cowslips and fields of, you know, oxide daisies just to harvest for the seed. Um, anyway, so I got this wildflower seed um, and then I thought, right, okay, what am I going to do? So I thought, right, I'll get some school kids involved. So I actually invited some kids from Iron Acton Primary School, which I, I know a friend um, had some kids there at the time. So they came and helped. But what you don't do is give some kids a carrier bag with 600 quid worth of seed in it. <laughs> Otherwise they go like that and you're like... So what you do actually, this is a tip if you're ever going to do this, is you mix it with sand. And if you mix it with sand, then when they spread the seed like that, you throw in it all out. You're not going to just get it all dumped in one spot. So we mixed it in sand and spread it out. And I also got them to spell out the initials of the school in Wildflower Seed, so IAS, Iron Acton School. I, and I was talking to someone about this and they said oh, apparently they heard some prisoners had a very similar job planting daffodil bulbs on the side of the motorway but when they came up it said F off on the side of the um, <laughs> but um, I was entirely convinced that Iron Act and School weren't going to do that and in fact I was right nothing came up and this is the funny thing is right I did this thinking we spread this seed over quite a lot of the field and I thought next year it would be amazing. And I went out there and there was nothing to see. A couple of years, I'm wearing year three now, I think, or maybe year four this year. And it's only just now that it's starting to get odd bits of uh, crop up and there's oxide daisy and yellow rattle and things like that. And it's taken a long time for this to start going because it, the thing about wildflower seeds, they don't always just take, you know, that's why they produce so many little seeds because not all of them are successful. Um, and it just goes to show that it's very easy for someone to go, oh, that one's spraying, but it's very hard to get it back. Yeah. And it's a long-term project, but it's a nice project to do. I'm really enjoying it. And it's certainly better than getting prisoners to do it. Yeah. Um, but that's, and that's why I do it really. Look, there's my two kids. And we, we go down there every year since, the, since I've had kids that we take, take that picture every year and they're growing up. At some point they'll be taller than me and I'll be a little squirt in the middle. <laughs> but it's a nice project to do with them. That's little Harry. They were running around. We had David Bowie on, on um, the music tonight because of the fact that he's died. And they don't know who David Bowie is, but they were both dancing around in their underpants in the lounge. <laughs> it's hilarious. Sorry, that's a little aside there. Um, anyway, so, uh, any ornithologists in? Very quiet. More hand. What? No, sadly. No. What? No, it is actually thrush. Someone said you said thrush. It's the missile thrush, and that's, and you can just see the mistletoe there. And I always say to groups, the thing about birds is they're very clever. And if I said to a, a WI group, so I was speaking to, as a competition, make a bird's nest. Could you make one as good as that? Bearing in mind they do it with a beak and a couple of little. It's incredible, isn't it? But um, anyway, that's just a little picture I took. And there they are. That's not, um, that swallows actually, but that was in the apex of the farmhouse. They come back every April. I'm looking forward to seeing them again this year, hopefully. Um, so we're in midsummer now, and there's my brother getting the cows in there. And we're just, and remember the tree with the, uh, which I said I planted, it's just at the top here, where my little arrow gone, just up there. 
But what's interesting is that some cows always seem to walk in the same spot. And you can see a cow path there where they made. And that's just because they've walked in the same spot. And if you look very closely, you can see last year's cow path there that's, that's grown over. I don't know why that is, but some cows always walk in the same spot. It's funny, isn't it? It's like creatures of habit. Hmm? That's my brother, yeah. Again, he's working and I'm not. <laughs> um, and there we are. There's the lineup of the three of us there. I, um, that picture, I did that on a, a timer, and you can see in my top pocket, you can just see the outline of the um, camera case. The interesting thing is, I, I do uh, used to do some stuff with Tesco's for milk uh, six, seven years ago, and, we, and the, the Telegraph came out to do an article about it, and they sent the photographer out to take a picture of us like that, and the bloke just said, just get the cow to stand there, and we'll take <laughs> <laughs> Well, if you've ever tried getting a cow to stand where you want it, it didn't work. And then we tried all sorts, and in the end we did a picture just like that, with them in the background in the collecting yard for the parlour. Because it was the only way you could get the cows in the picture with them staying still. And I've still got the old pictures, he emailed me pictures, of all these random cows all looking around, because he's trying to get them to stand still. Um, Anyway, here's our milking parlour, very old-fashioned milking parlour. It's called the Breast Parlour. You won't see these around anymore. It ticks over all right for 70 cows, but any more than that, it would be useless. Um, but, you know, it works for us. And it, the way the milk price is at the moment, there's no money to invest in anything better, really. So we've just got to keep going on that. Um, we milk them twice a day, and then we put it in the bolt tank there. Um, and we did supply dairy crest until December. The dairy crest has now been bought out by Muller, so we're now supplying Muller. Mm -hmm and it's milk's going to Stonehouse. Um, the interesting thing is that we supply the milk in that bulk tank, it's cooled down to below five degrees. Above five degrees, they won't take it. Um, but we have to, they only pick it up every other day. You know when you pick up a bottle and it says fresh milk on it? <laughs> it's not quite as fresh as you think because dairy companies only want to pick up your milk every day if they can, because it reduces their transport costs. And if, you can only, if you've only got storage to store it for one day, they actually penalise you and reduce your payment. Because what they do is they give you a thing called the every other day collection bonus, which is really a penalty for the guys who can't provide storage for two days. But it's all about, I mean, you imagine these tankers, they hold 20,000 litres of milk. They use a lot of fuel. I think they do about 11 miles to the gallon or something. So you can imagine running those around. They don't want to drive them too much. Anyway, moving on here. Any, have you had the Hawke and Owl Trust talk to you at all? No? If you're looking for speakers, that's probably a group to contact. They're based at Iron Acton, I think. They provide us with um, barn owl boxes. Um, that's one that we've had on the farm. We've had quite a bit of success with that. We've had the barn owls back on the farm for about six, seven years. And it's something that I'm really proud of because it means that the environmental work I'm doing on things like the common, are kind of paid off. And there's a barn owl pellet there I've opened up. I think if you came around on the farm walk, some of you, you might have seen me show you a barn owl pellet. And I always show people and I never remember to wash my hands afterwards and have a biscuit later. <laughs> <laughs> it's always a bit of an issue when I... Oh, yeah, what's... <laughs> <laughs>
My middle name is Pullin because the Pullins were the people who had the farm before us and I've kept that Pullin name going because my, my son Jack is now Jack Pullin Cornock. So it's a nice link with the past because the, the Pullin family had the farm until 1822 and then we married into the family and got the farm, if you like. It's quite a good way of getting a farm, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I think my two sons, I, I should give them a bit of advice. Join young farmers. <laughs> Make sure you find someone who's, who's got no brothers <laughs> and got a farm. <laughs> if only it was that easy in life, eh? Um, now we're back in the hay meadow there, and there we go, we're, we're hay making there. It's not something that everyone does these days, because it's a lot of work. But also, it's very difficult to get a window of a week of, of good weather in this country, isn't it, to make hay? It's a lot easier to make silage in one day than it is to rely on uh, hay making weather for one week. You've got to make hay while the sun shines, as they say. So we, we, we ted it all out like that, and then the baler comes in. We do a lot of contract work with a company called Samson's who are not far from us, principally because it's just all the little bits and pieces we do, it's not worth owning a baler again. We, we make 600 bales of, of hay a, a year probably. It's not worth us buying a baler for that. So we get them to come in and they bale it up. There we go, we stack it up there. My brother's on the trailer there. Um, so it's a lot of work really, but I do love you know what it's like if any of you smelt fresh hair you know what that's, that smell you can't beat it can you it's, oh it's beautiful and my kids love it I'm, I'm you know suddenly i think when you have children you suddenly really appreciate a lot more things really um hay making for my kids is just like whoa this is fantastic of course they haven't got to lift the bales they just got to go and look at them <laughs> um but we had a picnic on them this year with the kids they loved it um so we're into about august time now it starts getting a bit misty and autumnal of end of august um Again, this picture was taken on top of Tiverton Hill. There's another dent in my car roof as I took this picture. But this picture was taken at six o'clock in the morning and you can tell I'm on the way to work actually and you can tell I'm late for work because can you see the cows stood in the gateway there? They're just waiting. Because cows are a creature of, of time and habit and they, they kind of know when milking time is. And if you're late, they go, what time to call this? We've been waiting here with a full udder since it's half past six. Half past six o'clock. But I drove into the farmyard and went out and got them in the, in the field. And there you go. Six o'clock in the morning, a lovely misty morning. I know everyone loves a beautiful sunset, but there's some beautiful sunrises. You just got to get up early to see them, really. Um, and then, so this autumn fruits start coming. Of course, you know what these are, don't you? Well, as an interesting story is when I had the the book published, um, I spoke to um, this editor called Jasper, who was a quite a trendy kind of uni guy. And he rang me up and said, or texted me and, uh, and said, Rich, not quite sure where the black currants fit in with the farming. <laughs> <laughs> it's, kind of, um, it's kind of funny because from the countryside, you kind of know what these things are and you forget that not everyone does, do they? You know? And your experiences are different depending on where you come from. So you live in the middle of a city, you're not probably going to see loads of these elderberries and you don't know what they are. You also won't see someone like this very often. Uh, and that's Graham the ferreter. I was on Radio Two, Radio Four, the farming program. We went ferreting with Radio Four with him um, back last January. Um, what I did is on the year that I photographed the farm, I photographed everyone involved with the farm as well. I thought it's nice to have a record, so I photographed the vet, I photographed the cattle haulier, I photographed Graham the ferreter. But he's the only one who made the book because he's the only one that the, the editor decided was interesting enough. And he's a bit quirky, isn't he? I mean, you're not going to meet a bloke like that every day, are you? Um, he, he comes around and, and gets the rabbits. Um, he's an interesting bloke. He is a real, you know, they don't make him like Graham anymore. You know, 50 years ago, there would have been loads of people like that around, wouldn't there? Um, so I'm going to show you now the picture that the, the editor decided was too shocking for, um, for publication. There we go. Now, this is the picture of the rabbits after they've been gutted and hung up. Um, and it's interesting because, you know, some people, the editor was worried about putting this in the book because he said, oh, some people would be upset and offended by this. But the thing is, it's very easy to be upset and offended when you've got a full stomach and the test goes down the road, isn't it? Because the thing is, 50 years ago or during the war, everyone went out and got rabbits and stuff. And blimey, you weren't worried about what their picture looked like because if you could, it was the only meat you could get. But now we're all kind of like used to something wrapped in plastic, aren't we? That is kind of comes and you can't really tell what it is and everything. So uh, it's interesting. Of course, you get the alternative side of it. You get people like Jamie Oliver who still kind of use stuff like this occasionally and things. Um, and what's interesting is this bloke does sell these into a, a, um, uh, a butchers in Bristol, but they are magic rabbits as well because at some point it, between 
uh, Titherington and Bristol, they turn into organic rabbits. <laughs> <laughs> you can't be... <laughs> you can't be a magic rabbit, can you? <laughs> if you're in Bristol, that's what you want to see on the label, isn't it? Um, I don't know. Anyway, we're coming on now to... Uh, there's a cow carving. Uh, when I was dealing with the um, when I was dealing with the editor of the uh, the book, um, he did say to me, "Oh, Rich, you don't see any pictures of a cow carving," and I went, "Well, are you sure you want a picture of a cow carving?" And he went, "Yeah." So I sent him a, a CD or DVD with about fifty pictures, and then he contacted me. He goes, "Ooh, actually, I see what you mean." <laughs> I, th I think he thought it was going to be all kind of flowers and you know all beautiful and everything like that it's not that lovely you know so this is the one I, we settled for and then this is the um calf it's literally probably a minute old and you see the mum licking it there it's not even got its eyes open um but you can see what they're like a little bit later on that's they were about three weeks two weeks old there that that's where the little camera came in when i was doing these pictures because i literally was feeding the calves that morning and you can see i could just whip it out of my pocket with one hand press the button take a picture and I hadn't had to worry about setting it all up because if I had, I probably wouldn't have captured that moment where they're dribbling the milk there. And it's a very natural picture because it just looked at me and went, Ooh. <laughs> uh, Anyway, so we're into autumn now and we um, got some nice pictures there. That's, that's um, actually field maples, which are the same trees that are down the, were down the Isle of Westminster Abbey when William and Kate got married. They were put there in pots by Charlie Boy. Um, <laughs> And there's poor, poor dad grafting away again. <laughs> He's up the tree there. This is, this is a, a particularly bad picture because if you look at him, he's chucking the pears down to my sister and my nephew's eating them. <laughs> so what hope has he got of filling that basket? It's terrible, isn't it? Um, but but uh, we are lucky to have these fruit trees on the farm and also to have things like these are Jupiters and these are varieties that you won't find in Tesco's or Morrison's or whatever. Um, and it's interesting, if you go into a supermarket, you'll always find the pretty well the standards, won't you? Discovery and Cox's and Pink Lady and stuff. But there's a lot of varieties out there you just don't see. And, and that, the reason for that, I think, is because they, they've got to focus on what will keep it's not only, I mean, some of the fruit in the supermarket is nice, don't get me wrong, but they don't always do all these other lovely varieties because things like these Jupiters haven't got a massive shelf life. So they want ones that won't bruise and won't, you know. But uh, there are other fruit out there that you don't see that I'm lucky I can get hold of that other people don't have. And if you ever see a Jupiter apple, it's worth having because they're really lovely. I really like them. Um, of course, you get things like the rose hips in the hedgerows. Can anyone remember what rose hips are good for? Rose hips. So what's the other one? Yes, it's in powder. Tell the naughty people in the room. That, that lady at the back there, she looks to me like she's a real troublemaker. <laughs> because I remember going, I went to school on a coach. I used to go to Marwood School. And the coach I went on used to drive all around the villages picking up all the kids. And of course, if you get on there with a couple of rose hips and you put them down the back of someone sat in front of you, oh, really, really, really itchy. They're amazing. Inside, if you ever open up a rose hip, they're little seeds. They're really hairy. And those little hairs are really itchy. So my two boys are going to earn a few tricks off me. <laughs> um, anyway, we're, we're harvesting the maize here, uh, ready for our winter feed here. And there's the maize harvest. You can see what a beast that is, isn't it? You wouldn't want to trip over in front of that. Uh, and then the, it's November time, the cows come in there, you can see um, we, we do self-feed size, which again is a bit old-fashioned, but for our herd it works okay. But you can see uh, the size has gone brown, it's pickled there, you can see it's a brown colour, but it's still full of nutrients and stuff. So they come in in about November when we shut the gate. Um, our young cattle are still out then, at that point, because they don't need, we don't need to worry about milking them or anything, they can stare and sort of ex extensively graze. Um, we give them a bit of the hay and then and then this happens which we, we're used to this year aren't we we've seen quite a lot of this um we've got some low-lying fields normally where we graze the heifers and the, and the banks of the river quite or the stream that goes through it quite often burst and flood the um fields so we then got to make definitely make sure they're in there uh, in fact they're like that now all this last we've had so much rain this year it's incredible isn't it i i don't know about you but i'm actually just sick of it now <laughs> um of course, you get the old tree blow down and stuff. We make good use of that using my dad and his lovely. <laughs> 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 
Here's my dad as a, and his trusty tractor. Um, my dad, one owner from knew that tractor. He bought it brand new in 1956. Um, and you can see that horrible blade there. Since I had the book published, I've actually had a load of guarding put over that blade because I was very conscious once we went public with this, it was a bit... But the thing is, my dad has used... He won't wear goggles, he won't wear glasses. But the thing is, he's used it for 60-odd years. I think he's probably got a better idea how it runs than most people. Uh, although, to be honest, this, this last year, I've started doing a lot of the cutting the wood up myself now because I think it's time, Dad, you can back away from the saw blade. Um, but we also employ child labour on the farm to do this. <laughs> so we get the kids in, involved with stacking. Stop putting them up the chimney, Sorry? Sorry? Stop putting them up the chimney. Stop putting up the chimney, yeah. but we get them to stack logs instead. Um, and then, of course, we're coming into December time. We've still got a few of the old apple trees on it. And there's a Morgan sweet tree there with all the, the mistletoe. I did a thing on Radio Gloucestershire about that mistletoe um, in December. We went down and picked some for the Radio Gloucestershire newsroom, actually. Um, and there we go. It's lovely. It's amazing, that tree. It's all over it. Um, and then we're coming through on a frosty day there. It's a frosty day. We didn't, I, can anyone remember what a frosty day is like? It's ridiculous, isn't it? I haven't seen proper frost this year. Um, I quite like frosty days because it means the ground's not all wet. Right. Now, th this is where I've got to ask you a question, OK? I've, I can either sort of quit now or we can go on for 10 minutes. Which do you, what do you do? 10 minutes, you right with that? I know I've rabbited on quite a long time. Right, okay. Um, so, I, I've done all these pictures of the farm. You've seen my year on the farm, or, or most of it. Um, I got to about November, okay, this is the story of how it went on from there. I got to about November and I thought, what am I going to do with these photographs? Because you know what it's like, you, you put things on the computer and no one ever sees them, do they? Yeah. So I thought, well, mum and dad's Christmas present, I'd make this book. And here it is, I, I did it on the internet. You can, anyone can do these, they're true print or Tesco's to do them. This was done, it was about 50 quid, so I went for the hardcover and the deluxe and everything. So I had this book made, it cost me 50 quid, and it was all, I gave it to mum and dad for Christmas present. You see some of the pictures in there that you saw earlier. I, I gave them that, and it uh, kind of went down quite well, and people said to me, oh, you know, that's really nice, you should get that published. Well, the thing is, it's easy to say that, isn't it? But I don't even know about publishing or anything. Um, but what happened, I was looking in the Western Daily Press one day and I was reading about this lady who just had a book published by Amberley Publishing, a local book. And I looked it up and I thought, oh, crikey, they're actually only based in Stroud. And they, they normally do books, you might have seen them, they do, this, there's one, Kidderminster through time, but they normally do sort of a lot of local history books and things they do. They've probably done Chipping Sobbery through time where they do pictures, you know, like from 1890 and then they take the same picture and compare it, which I always find quite interesting. Um, they do a few weird ones. It's an illustrated guide to Armageddon. Um, I, I don't know if there's Armageddon, who's going to hang around illustrating it? Um, but I, I contacted them and said, look, I've done this book. Would you be interested? Because on their website, they've got a thing that says, if you've got an idea for a book, please contact us. So I, I did just contact them. I, and they said, come and, see, come and see us. So I went for a chat and they said, well, we'd like to publish it. And I was like, oh, blimey. Try. Because I don't know, you know, they said to me, could you write your story of the year with the book? Because the thing is, with mum and dad's copy, I didn't write hardly anything. Because they don't need to be told what a cow is or, <laughs> you know, what tractors in the... Because they already know. So, so I said, yeah, OK, I'll, I'll write something. Anyway, I, I did that. And then they, they decided... I said, where's it going to be printed then? And they, I thought it would say printed in China. Because most books you pick up these days, they're made printed abroad, cheap somewhere, aren't they? And they said, actually, it's printed down in... Um, Portbury Docks, Hampton's printing. So I went down to Portbury Docks and saw it being printed, which is quite a nice thing to do, actually. Uh, the printing press on my, over my shoulder there was three million quid that it was printed on. Printed in these big sheets, and then it's cut down and, and bound and stuff. You can see some of the pictures there that you saw earlier, like there's my brother there with the cow and stuff. Uh, and it was interesting, when I was walking around, I spoke to the bloke and I said, how long have you worked here? And he said, oh, I've been here 19 years. 
And I said, well, how many people have been down to see the book being printed since you've worked here? And he goes, you're the first. Oh. <laughs> so obviously I was the newsiest. <laughs> but I always like to see how things, that's my thing, I think. I always like to see how, how things work behind the scenes. I always find that interesting. And it was interesting to go and see this. They print a lot of magazines and things like that down there normally. Um, so this was going to be the original cover. That was the demo. And they decided that that wasn't quite what they wanted to do. So they changed it to that one which is a lot more kind of interesting thing and bit, grabs you a bit. Um, so when the book come out, came out, I ha then had some interest. That, that was the Points West. They came out and filmed me for Points West one day, um, which was nice. Uh, and then I started getting a bit of publicity uh, and the magazine. This is Amateur Photography magazine. They said they came out to see me. Man, of all, Man for All Seasons. My wife's got a completely different name for me than that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's good to have a title really isn't it um, but then it was quite interesting from that it led to a quite a, a few other things first of all I got um, contacted by Smallholder magazine and they said to me would you be interested in writing a series of, of articles about how to rear cattle uh, and this is where this is really really funny because I've never never been interested in photography okay I just happened to take some pictures because I thought it was a record never so I never thought I'd get a book of photographs out I never, I've never been interested in writing, but someone offered me a kind of option to write some stuff. So I thought, I'll give it a go. So here we are with my auntie's Dexter cow there. She's got a small holding at Arlston, so I use that as a cover. And there she is as a cover girl. Uh, and there we go, Choosing Your Cattle. That was a, a series of articles I wrote there. Um, so, so from that, I then got a, um, a phone call from the National Farmers Union. Uh, they, they have a magazine called the British Farmer and Grower, um, which is sort of a, comes out to anyone who's in the National Farmers Union subscription magazine, goes out to 60,000 people. Uh, they rang me up and they said, we quite like your writing style, because they've read, seen the book. I said, I didn't know I had a writing style. <laughs> um, would you be interested in writing a column for us? And I first of all said, oh, actually, I don't think I could do that, because it's not really... I said I'm not used to writing. I, I, I actually said to them, could I do something like a blog or something? Because I always figure if it's online, it kind of like, it won't, you know, no one sees it. Whereas if it's actually in your magazine, it seems a bit more proper, really. Uh, and they go, no, 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 um, we'd like you to write a column for us. So I, I agreed to do it. And then I've been, so I've been doing, on and off, I've been doing Cornox Corner, um, which, which is actually really enjoy doing. I'm not sure whether I'm going to be carrying it on now because I'm on my third editor. And they keep changing the style of the magazine and stuff. But I've survived for three, five, four years, I think. I, do it, I don't do it every, all the time, but every now and then I do it. And that one was about, Cider with Richie, that was about the Wurzels playing in the local pub. It's a little bit light-hearted. I don't really want to go too serious. So I just do every, every now and then I do a little bit of banter and stuff. So I, I did that. And then I ended up... I don't know, every, I get quite lucky with a lot of things, actually. I, this chap on the left is a guy called Ben Prater. Um, and at the time he was doing a drive time show on BBC Radio Bristol and they did an interview, he did an interview me about my book and at the end of the interview I just said to him, oh you ought to come down and get your hands dirty on the farm. Well I, I didn't think I'd hear from him again. Anyway he came down on an October morning and, and didn't leave for two years. Uh, <laughs> and for two years we did a series called Get Off My Land! <laughs> which which um, played out on uh, Radio Bristol. We had a real laugh with it actually, I loved it. We did, um, we made our own sausages, the Bristol Blue sausage there, which was, um, yeah, it was, we, what we did, we, we had a competition from the listeners to m think of a sausage to make. And the, and the winner was Uncle Sluggy from Bedminster came up with the Bristol Blue, which is pork and blueberries. Because obviously blue is the colour of Bristol, isn't it? Yeah. So we then went to our local butcher at Alveston and we made Bristol Blue sausages. And believe it or not, he won a South West Sausage Award with them. <laughs> I didn't get any money out of this. I <laughs> should have been on royalties, really. Um, but we also did things like we made our own cheese. Absolutely <laughs> disgusting, I can tell you. Um, we, we went beekeeping. We... we <coughs> I talked to drive a tractor. We all, we did lots of interesting, fun things, and I really enjoyed it. Um, sadly, that came to an end um, when he then left to go to Radio Wiltshire. He's now doing the breakfast show on BBC Radio Wiltshire. If you tune in, to, tune in, I think between half six and nine, he's on there. But he's a good mate of mine still. We still keep in touch, and he's got one of the trees in the orchard. Um, off the back of it, though, I, I've continued doing radio, and I sort of pop up every now. I was on. 
I was on about four times on Radio Gloucestershire in December and I was on Radio 4 on January the 2nd as part of their review of the year on the Farming Today programme and I've got some more stuff lined up for Radio Gloucestershire coming up. Um, I quite like radio because you don't have to look tidy or anything. <laughs> you know, you, you can just you can be in your boiler seat of wellies and they think you look like Omar Sharif. You know? <laughs> um, but it's also I find it it's not intimidating. I've done a little bit of television, only a small amount. And if you've got a bloke with a camera there, you feel really self-conscious. But quite often when you're on the radio, even in the studio, it's just chatting. And everyone can do chat, can't they? We're not doing a script, so you're not worried about what you say. As long as you don't swear, I think you'll be all right, really. So if any of you get a chance to do any radio or anything, don't worry about it, because I find it, I think it's quite easy. Um, but moving on from that, a lot of these things like the radio and the, and the writing stuff are out of my control. I don't get kind of like, you know, I don't know when I'm going to get asked. But what I've moved on to is a few little things of myself. So this is my plug now. I've nearly finished, OK? This is my plug is that I do my own major greetings cards. And I've got them here. £1.50 if you want them. If anyone wants a book, I've got a couple here, £14. I also do farm walks. Some of you have been on those in the summertime. If anyone wants to do a farm walk, just let me know. But the main thing I've concentrated on now is I do a YouTube channel called The Funky Farmer, OK? Now, if any of you know about YouTube, it's basically videos that people upload and broadcast on there. Um, and surprisingly, I'm actually quite big in YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds really funny, doesn't it? Because... Um, I didn't know I would be. I, I, I've been uploading videos. What, I, what happened is I was going to photograph, I photographed the farm and then I thought I'd do a video version of the book and that was really, I, w I didn't have a plan. I thought I'd do a DVD or something and in, in the end you realise you can't condense it all onto a DVD. It'd be about 50 DVDs, it'd be ridiculous. So I started uploading them to YouTube, okay? Um, and now, I believe it or not, I've got 700 videos on YouTube but I get 13,000 views a day on YouTube. I've got 12,500 subscribers to the channel and it's building all the time. It's something I, you know, it's, this is a, technology is amazing because it, it wasn't available a few years ago but now it's something I can do. What I do is I, I put one or two videos a, a week on there and it's usually me working on the farm and I now realise you've got to talk to your audience so I do a little kind of now and speak to it. I did a little dance video the other week actually, it'd be stupid, I might show you in a minute. Um, but it, it's, it's enjoyable for me because the thing is, you, you'd be surprised. You probably see more people in your week than I see in a month. Because I'm on my own on the farm most of the time, or my brother and my dad. And this gives me a kind of link with the outside world, and I really enjoy that because there isn't, it's quite solitary farming. And sometimes you need an outlet to just give you a bit of kind of oomph, if you know what I mean. And that's why I do it, really. It, it makes my life a bit of fun. So I get feedback. They're watched by people all around the world. And I get comments and things like that and respond to them. Some are good, some are, po some are positive, some are negative, but you take that with it, really. Anyway, I'm going to show you, I'm going to finish now with a couple of videos. Or maybe just one, I don't know. Do you want the dancing one or not? Yeah. 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 This is really stupid. We've got two, two videos then. Right, this is the Funky Farmer dance, which I did at Christmas. Um, I don't know whether you can see it. This is the Funky Farmer for the Funky Farmer channel. And I just did this really stupid because life's too short, isn't it? Like, you can't hear the music, which is unfortunate. Can you hear that?
and it, that's just a bit. That's just a bit of a kind of like stupid thing. I my, that's the only stupid stuff I do on there, honestly. But there is an extended version of that, but you don't want that one. Um, but what I what I've learned is that you you have an audience that you kind of like want to sort of appeal with and, and talk to. So some, I did a Christmas message, if you like, and then stuck that on the end. So that was just a bit of a laugh, really. Um, but what I'm going to leave you with now is something that you nearly made it to Points West. Okay. Let's stop that cow just jumping on the back there. <laughs> uh, okay, so this is, I'm going to finish with this video, okay? This is the number one video on my YouTube channel. It's been watched by 700,000 people now. Um, so it's quite popular. Um, but there's a funny story in the fact that um, you might remember about three years ago, I think, we had a really harsh spring and it was really cold. It's a completely opposite from now, where the grass didn't grow and there was, it was just so cold in March that the, the cattle had to be kept in longer and we actually ran out of silage and we were buying grass in. A lot of farmers were having problems with that. Um, and uh, Ali Vowles from BBC Points West came down to film us about this and to film the cows going out. And this is the video that nearly made it to Points West. And I say nearly because it was a Monday she came down. Okay, so she came down at 9.30. And we did a piece to camera about the uh, harsh spring and the fact that we had to buy the grass in. And then she filmed the cows going out and it was a lovely video. And then she drove off and she said, I said, well, when's it going to be on the telly? And she goes, well, it'll be on about 1.30, points west time. And then it'll be on again at about 6.30, I think that's the other time it's on. Fortunately, between the time she left our farm and when she got to Bristol, Margaret Thatcher died. So, <laughs> so obviously, cows going out, Margaret Thatcher died. And it's sort of like, which one was more important? So it got binned that day. She emailed me that night and she said, don't worry, although it's not on now, it'll be on tomorrow because, you know, it's still a nice piece. Anyway, on, on that evening, there was a riot in Bristol because Margaret <laughs> Thatcher died. <laughs> and... Uh, so obviously that was a bit more important. Someone setting fire to a few cars than, than our cows. So what happened in the end is the, um, the video got binned and all they did was they showed a very small segment along with the weather saying, you know, about how cold it was and they showed, introduced that. Which is quite, I think it's quite ironic because Margaret Thatcher was always known as the milk snatcher, wasn't she? And even in death, she snatched the milk, milk from the cow. <laughs> but this is the video I made, which was like very similar. And we'll see this now. Let me just turn that down. So the cows always at sort of March time will get a sense that the spring is here, but we can't let them out really until there's enough grass in the field. So here we are about the 3rd of April and I'm just about to open the gate and they're all queuing up. You can see they're kind of ready to go almost, aren't they? Like, like, a, like the start of a race really, all lined up, ready to start a race. So I'm opening the gate here. Now the thing is, I'm actually running backwards with a camera at this point. <laughs> So if I tripped over, I think <laughs> there wouldn't actually be a lot left for me, really, would there? But here we go. Five, four, three, two, one. And it's quite incredible, isn't it? I think the thing is, everyone thinks of spring lambs, don't they? Yeah. But you kind of don't really like spring cows. And that's the orchard. You can see that you can see the uh, trees that I've planted there. I must admit, I'm jumping for joy when they go out as well because you know. The, the thing is, the cows are really heavy-duty beasts. They don't really—they're not designed for jumping, are they? But you see some of these skipping around, and and they really do jump in the air. <laughs> I think you look at the grass actually you can just see there's a bit of frost still on the grass I think it's still a bit white in places <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'll let that um, and you'll see if they, they come up they're almost like a shoal of fish they'll sort of all go they're all going back that way to, look see they're all coming back up <clears throat> and then in a minute they'll go up the other end and they'll turn around and come back but it's the time of year, I always try and hope that I'm there that day. I don't really want the day off on that day, because it's always lovely to see them go out, you know? Uh, but it's that they're only like that, really, for sort of a half an hour or so, and then they settle down. The next day they go out, they'll, they won't behave like that. It's just literally there. But I'll let that run out. It's nearly finished, and uh, I've finished as well. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Well, the cows may not have been very impressed with you, but I'm sure we are all delighted. You have given us a wonderful insight to your farm. And I can't tell you how pleased I am that I am on my feet tonight. I came to Titherington when I was 11 Did you? for a holiday. Wow. And that's many years ago. But the village really hasn't changed very much, has it? No, no. Really. But we've had a fantastic mm -hmm. evening. He's a wonderful speaker yeah, and yeah. a wonderful photographer. Yeah. And thank you for managing to fit us in in your <laughs> busy life. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Do come and look at the cards. They're really beautiful, as beautiful as the photographer. There's a tractor one here for any farmers. <laughs> <laughs>